Tesla stock might now be unlocked after the Fed's 0.5% rate cut and promises for more. With the shackles off, could the stock finally see a massive jump as one catalyst after another comes over the next several months? Plus, we've got a special segment showing you Ford's secret strategy and what they're really doing with a secret department in their company. We've got the bulls here with us. I'm Herbert Ong. I'm Alexander Mertz. I'm Jeff Lutz. I'm Larry Goldberg. Welcome, everybody. So the 0.5% rate cut just happened by the Fed. Larry, does this now allow, give permission for the stock to finally take off with catalyst after catalyst? Because everybody kept saying, you can't, they, none of that will happen until the rate cuts happen. Yeah, I wasn't one of those who said that. But firstly, the rate cut surprised me. I didn't think they would go 50 cents. 50 cents, I, I thought... Uh, 50, 50 basis points. I thought they would go 25 basis points. I was quite surprised to see that they did that. And, um, you know, the the stock reaction has been very strong. We're going into 10-10. We're going into, the, actually, we're going into the end of a quarter, which I think has been a very strong quarter. Um, I think that there are a lot of signs that we're going to see the stock you know, very strong, very strong. But um, whether it'll hold that strength after 1010 really depends upon what we see on 1010 and what we hear on some of the other product lines and products at, at the uh, at the uh, earnings call. The company and the product. I don't look at the quarterly stock movement. A very realistic bull. Questioning certain decisions. The rational bull. We enjoy listening to bears. We're looking for the red flags. You're supposed to react. Yeah, we only earned 50 cents a share the other day. The last quarter. I mean, come on, guys. Come on, Larry. <laughs> this is what everybody kept saying. Well, we have to first see the rate cuts. And then only after rate cuts, then we're going to see the others. Now you're telling me, well, we have to see what happens on 1010. Then we have to see what happens on the next one. Herbert, if you want to, you know, if if you want a bullish view, you got to ask a bull. I'm neither a bull nor a bear. I just call it as I see it. All right, Jeff. Yeah. Um, so in this situation, it's really a setup in terms of you have to start connecting a couple of quarters together. Okay. So Tesla is in this regime right now where they're holding MSRPs. They've got new products coming that are going to be at lower MSRPs. They don't want to go in and crowd them. So they're working on financing deals. They're working on, you know, down payment deals to get people structured into buying vehicles. Cause again, we're at a, a, a low point in terms of, at least in the United States and probably most of Western Europe, in terms of rates and in terms of people's ability to get loans, one in five people are getting rejected right now in the US. It's the highest ever for auto loans. 80% of people that buy a car use financing to get them. So you can see what that's doing the sale. So all the automakers are doing this. I know a lot of people make a big deal because this is new to Tesla. They're all doing them. They're structured differently in terms of how they get their financing, how they get their money. But this is something that Tesla can do on the on the downside of, uh, or the call it the favorable side of rate normalization, where we're going to go from uh, being basically 300 basis points above inflation, and we're going to start knocking that off. The Fed showed a dot plot, and it shows them you know taking a considerable amount off over the next 18 months. So now that we know that Tesla's going to keep these financing deals in place, in my opinion, they have to get to their next generation of vehicles that come in at lower prices. Uh, so in terms of what is the stock price going to do, we're between a couple of different near-term things. You know I don't like to do any near-term prognostications, but we have deliveries coming up. And then sandwiched in between deliveries and earnings is the 1010 RoboTaxi event. I think there's a lot that's pinned onto that. Is Tesla going to introduce a new business model? And when is that business model going to take hold? And have they is Tesla introduced something else now to the world that may take others, you know, many years, four or five years to catch up on? I think those are the key things to look out for. And finally, analysts have to start connecting a few things together. I think earnings are going to be under pressure given all the financing deals that are happening globally, including China, who's having, you know, great sales. It's compared, by the way, to a Q3 from 
last year where they were ramping up Highland. But point is, is Tesla's doing these financing deals everywhere. They're still taking COGS down. If they're going to have very high volumes, they're going to do pretty well from a COGS perspective. But I think gross margins will still be under pressure. So analysts have to start, back to my first point, they have to start connecting a few quarters together and saying, all right, they've done this. We're on the debt. We're on the favorable side of easing. That's going to improve where Tesla's not going to have to do it as much anymore in the future. Can we add two and two together, get them to their next generation of vehicles and realize that this thing is, you know, on the uptrend, couple that with their, you know, their call for 2.7 million in production in 2025, you know, I think that's what people have to start connecting together and everybody's got a different time horizon. If your time horizon is three weeks in their robo taxi event, good luck, you know, you know, you know, flip a coin and figure out what you're going to do. If your time horizons, you know, 18 months or longer or multiple years, I think I've laid out in terms of what I see happening over that time period. Thanks, Jeff. Alexandra? Yeah, and I would like to add, I think I said that last week as well, but just want to make sure everybody hears that. Um, the way Tesla structures financing is they are taking a hit from the cost of proposing to a client a 1% or 2% loan, yet having to finance it at 5 6 7% in the market. They hate taking that hit immediately. So it has an immediate impact for the full amount over the whole life of the loan or of the financing as of today in this quarter. All the other OEMs don't do that. They stretch the financing. Well, first of all, they have a financing arm. So they are constantly playing the yield curve. They are constantly arbitraging um, their exposure. And when they give up out loans, which they do obviously much more aggressively than Tesla ever has, that is then stretched over the whole duration of that loan. It is incorporated into their balance sheets over the years that the loan is is running and is on their books. So it's a completely other way of seeing it. So you may see in the short term a higher impact of these attractive loans on Tesla than you will see on others. And at the same time, you may see actually in medium and long term a higher obligation of these OEMs when the rates come down to still honor payments at a higher rate. So it, 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 in the medium and long term, it may as well not work out for them. But in the short term, it is certainly heavier on, on Tesla than it is on anybody else. Okay. You know, this is not about whether you're a bull or you're a bear, right? This is interest rate cuts, which affect automakers in general. Automakers create cars that are very expensive. Some people can't buy it. What is it? 85% of consumers who purchase an auto, they finance it. They take out loans or it's leased. So a rate cut matters. And that's what Elon Musk said, right? They said that the reason why the stock, you know, they had to do price cuts, why they were affected last year too, is because of interest rates. So that's step one. And step two, interest rate cuts matter for growth companies, for growth stocks. Tesla's one of those. So now more people are more willing to invest in a growth stock. So that's what I mean by interest rate cuts. Well, you're not a Tesla bull, not a bull doesn't matter. You are. You, you will now have um, the ability. It gives you the permission for some investors who are looking for growth companies to start looking at the growth, right? Like robo taxis coming in ten ten. So this rate cut came at a perfect time. It wasn't just for Tesla, right? It's a whole economic uh, outlook. Like the sentiment has changed because it's not just one rate cut. It's going to be multiple. Even um, Fed Chairman. Uh, Powell said that there's going to be another potential 0.5, 1% cut by the end of this year, and then another one next year. So this is a series of cuts. This is a change in, um, you know, the economy of where the, the perspective is. That's going to affect it. So what's going to happen now is all these catalysts that come for Tesla that could now be seen as moving the stock because before this, nobody would care. Nobody would even look at it. So... That's just uh, the perspective I was looking at. But hey, Herbert, one more thing for for people watching this: the Fed, the Fed cut the funds rate, but interest rates actually went up in the last day. So mortgages are more expensive, car loans are more expensive, slightly. The five, the seven year, slightly. Ten years up a little bit more. So the the bond markets they actually have to they have to cooperate with this. So if they're sensing recession, if they're sensing issues. The Fed can continue cutting, and those rates can continue going up. So, in terms exactly. of people, so so in terms of people, forty eight hours ago versus today, it is not cheaper for them to get a car loan yet. So it we is, have to see exactly. how this plays out. 
Exactly. Well, Mont- and and go Mont- ahead, Mont- rates did go to, uh, d- did tick down significantly um, this last week. So we are seeing some improvement in mortgage rates, but car loans not. And and this is a shorter term paper. So, uh, but but the the fifty the fifty basis point reduction is not you know traditionally i mean not traditionally is historically not a good indicator of future economic activity i have to say yeah, so we'll see yeah. we'll see yeah i i showed a, a statistic and uh what at the last time every time there's a, a cut an interest rate cut you know i think but i can't remember the exact number now but for is it 50 percent of or the vast majority of the time they would end into a recession <laughs> yeah and so they're going oh watch out we're going to get Don't into a recession that but, stuff you got to analyze it. You got to analyze it. They're all different situations. All there's 30 input variables that need to be looked at. You can't, you know, I know a lot of people want to summarize this and I'm not saying you do this, Herbert, just get this in 160 per, you know, character tweet, but this is a little bit more nuanced. So they're not all going to be the same. This is a very different environment where what causes recession supply side, then all the spending. So I think we have to analyze these different, you know, uh, a little bit differently. Mortgage rates have come down, Larry, but I'll tell you just in the last 24 hours, they did creep up and they were coming down because they were anticipating the cut that was going to occur. I it just, anyway, just I, for people thinking that like, oh, what, what, what Powell did yesterday, it's off to the races tomorrow. I don't know. We got to see how this plays out. I agree. I agree. I, I'm, I'm very skeptical of this economy, but. I will say that I think it's very bullish for Tesla more than any other OEM. You know, Tesla played a very canny game by repricing their vehicles. A lot of people, you know, criticize it and believe they could offset that kind of reduction in price by advertising. I mean, it was a sea change. Buyback, in pro- Larry. Buyback was the other. Buy, buy. <laughs> it was a sea change in pricing, and that sea change was strategic, and that's why the you know the the Model Y is the lo- is the best selling car in the world because of that strategic repricing. I don't believe they. I, I believe it was a master masterful move. Where the, where we go from here really depends on what they announce on 1010 if they're going to do a set of lower price cars alongside the robo taxi i think we'll see uh, auto sales at tesla go up over time if they're not going to if they're going to focus just on robo taxi changes the complexion i'm not saying good or bad i'm saying it changes the calculus entirely for the company do you guys think um yeah, so Jeff, you had said in your in your little thing just about five minutes ago, you said that you think that Tesla might keep its existing incentives. So in the last month, they uh, reduced the financing to 1.99%. Now that's supposed to end by the end of this month, September, and then it's going to go to 2.99%. Then they introduced zero down. Do you think that they're going to actually, did, was that in, in anticipation of a Fed rate cut? Or was that something that they're going to now, now that they have the Fed rate cut, they can actually even add more? Yeah, they, they've been, I mean, everybody's been telegraphing this cut. They didn't know if it was going to mean July or September. So in Q2, Tesla started a series of financing deals. They try them, they test them out, they see what the response is, and then they're probably adjusting these and, and, and seeing what they can do. So I think they're going to continue. We're, again, we're on the we're on the right side of history here. They could not have done this back to Larry's point, they could not have done this when, you know, we were raising rates for, you know, 18 months in, uh, in over 2023 and in 2022, end of 2022, they couldn't have done it. And what they had to do at that point in time, you remember in the first quarter of 2023, that was a price correction that was coming out of COVID. All the input prices were jacked up on all the commodities. And quite frankly, everything from a labor, it was scarce to get labor. Everything was jacked up. And so they were able to take their prices down faster. Why were they able to take their prices down faster? They have lower inventory, lower channel inventory. They've got a faster supply chain. And you know, so they were, they're, they're, 
Tesla's going to enter into these slowdown issues and they're going to come out of them faster. And if you look at what they did on pricing from about May of 2023 to where we are today, about 15, 16 months, very little change. What they've actually done is introduce lower end SKUs, maybe, you know, rear wheel drive and so forth to take their, you know, their, their uh, MSRPs down lower. And now they've introduced the financing, which is taking their net ASP down lower, different than MSRP. So allows them to stabilize pricing. So I think Herbert, they're going to continue this until they can introduce vehicles that are at lower MSRPs, which will by definition have lower net ASPs. They want to get people into a lower cost for, you know, their monthly bill. It's a, still a little bit of a difficult message. They don't have this good uh, messaging thing to talk about total cost yet. I think a lot of people are getting it word of mouth, but probably not enough. But I also see in the future, they'll be able to bundle insurance. They'll be able, they're already starting to bundle charging on some of the SKUs. And then people are going to see, wow, I, energy, insurance, and the, and the hunk of metal I'm driving around in, you know, my monthly costs are this versus the alternative. Yeah, I was sorry, sorry. No problem. I was just thinking the zero percent down is probably a good indicator that free cash flow is in a better situation now. Um, I mean, we had this extreme wake of spending on um, the AI effort, and uh, maybe that has calmed down, and they just you know can be generous on the free cash flow side. I don't think okay. free cash flow is an important metric when they look at 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 leasing i think that what is important to them is the actual margin on the car much more than the free cash flow look i'm very surprised more than surprised that tesla have not used leasing their net leasing the total leasing book has declined over the last year significantly and and it's it comes as a shock to me because I remember, you know, talking with um, Tesla IR back in 2022. And one of the things they said to me was, look, we've got, you know, we've got a lot of levers to pull. One of the most powerful levers we've got to pull is leasing. We don't, we don't do much leasing and we don't price our leasing very competitively. That's a lever that, you know, could really open the spigot. And so when, you know, when, when they were struggling with sales, I thought that was the spigot they were going to open. They never did. In well, fact, there, there are two reasons for that. First of all, what they had on the leasing books last year, they repackaged as, as, as a back security. So that's why you see a lesser amount now, but they put, they put a lot, I think it was 1.5 billion into asset backed securities. The second is what they did with leasing the last three years, they obviously have an issue with residual values. I mean, I completely agree with you that it was a master stroke to, to uh, go down with the pricing. But for example, when I leased my Model X, it was on, if I would have purchased it, it would have been 122,000 then. It's now 89 or 87, I don't remember. So it's considerably lower. When I will hand it back next year, it is still on their books at over 100,000. So the, the, um, they have some residual loss on the leases they have engaged over the last three years because of the price cuts. Yeah, when I say they've reduced their leasing, I don't mean that they've reduced the book. I mean, they've reduced the number of cars they're leasing. So when they sell that paper, it doesn't change the, the that doesn't change the equation at all. But what what I meant was that they had the opportunity of leasing a large number of cars, and they stopped that leasing because they thought they saw they were going to reduce the price of cars. So I think you know that was the basis of of holding back on the leasing, but it still is a lever that they can pull, uh, particularly particularly cars that they would have leased with FSD built into it because, you know, they get to take that FSD back and that would be a significant potential asset. Anyway, this is where we are. And I think we're, we're about to go from, you know, this constant decline in prices to a steadying, if not even an increase in pricing. Although the what average, lever are we talking about? 
the lever of being able to lease, but using lease as a as a sales lever. I just I I can go on the website and lease a Tesla. Can you? What what? Are, yeah, what but are, not, not a Cybertruck, for example. It's how they price right. it. It's Jeff. The lever is only okay. an issue of pricing. So right now they are the most expensive leasing company in the. In you know, there's, there's no more expensive way to 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 buy a Tesla than lease it. Thanks for clarifying that. Okay, so I, I just want to clarify what I've been saying, and it sounds like so far none of you took a bait and aren't going to jump on this, which is that the rate cuts, as it happens over this year and as it happens over next year, it's what uh, it needed to happen before Tesla could break through and actually start to, you know, the stock yeah. rising again based on catalyst. If the rate cuts weren't happening, if this wasn't the environment we're headed into, and if it can reverse, it can easily reverse. I'm not saying it's going to happen next year then a growth company like Tesla, it's a lot harder for people to think, oh, this, you know, when this is solved, all of a sudden the stock's going to jump. That's what I'm saying. I disagree modestly. I mean, I'm not, I'm not harshly disagreeing with you, but I do believe um, interest rates are a factor, but it's not as big a factor than to any other car company, just because the business model is shifting. And Tesla has so many other sources of future revenue. So while interest rates are a major factor for any car maker, just because it's the second asset, it is financed or leased in 80% of the cases, even 85, if I recall it right. So the, the, it has an impact, it has an impact on the monthly payments and, and all that, but soon people will not buy a Tesla because of the monthly payment. The, this yeah. is going to shift yeah. and, and that, that's where interest rates in my view are less important. Yeah, you're a bull. You're thinking that even if the rate cuts, you know, not as important because maybe robotaxi is solved and then the stock will rise. Maybe robots, right? I agree in that sense. I'm just saying that this is one of the key parts that everybody's been watching for. There's no so. doubt that a reduction in the mortgage rate is bullish for vehicle sales and particularly for Tesla because they're at the higher end. But I think that depending on what they what 1010 brings there could be a you know significant increased potential tam for tesla which a lower interest rate would be very bullish in that case yeah i agree i mean it's gonna help but tesla's organic the things that they're doing organically quite frankly to me are have more impact than uh, than what they're doing with interest rates. The new vehicles at the new price points, continuing to re reduce COGS, and then expanding your availability of FSD supervised globally, those things are going to, and energy and everything else is going to drive more than the interest rate reduction, to be honest with you. Remember, we're we're not getting to zero interest rates next year unless something really bad happens. That's the regime that Tesla grew up in over its over its lifetime. We're Maybe we get back to, I don't know, 3.5%. Yeah, three, three and a half percent. Still going to take off. That a means years. a lot to the consumer, a lot. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm actually the least bull here <laughs> again. Okay. I heard something from Larry this morning, Alexandra and Jeff. It is a bit of a shock. He has this feeling, sense that there's a potential that Tesla may not actually roll out the more affordable vehicles. Uh, do you want to explain yourself, Larry? Yeah. You know, I have the sense that Elon has made a commitment and, you know, there was this argument famously that uh, Walter put in his book, Walter Isaacson put in his book that, you know, there was this argument and the management won the argument with Elon that they were going to build not only the robo-taxi but also this more affordable car. I think that when Elon made the this tremendous cut in the in the employee and the management base, I think he also changed course. I think he went back to his original strategy. That's just my sense of it, because when we when we saw the you know the parking lot the parking garage closed off. There was talk about one car. We've seen, you know, just the one car. I, it's just a feeling I've got. We'll see what happens, but that's that's a potential issue. 
And I'm not sure how important it is. Well, they reiterated it on the last earnings call. So mm -hmm. he made the he made the reduction, the reductions in April. And at least he announced they announced him in I think in April. And that's where they also reveal they're doing these vehicles. Uh, and he was on the earnings. He's on both earnings calls. So yeah, that would be quite the surprise. I went back and read that about three weeks ago. I didn't see it as clearly as you, you putting it, Jeff, but maybe I'm wrong. I have the hope that they come in 2025 as announced very early um presentation and then roll out during well that was my original thought that they were going to have those cars there at the 1010 event oh but, no I, that, I don't think so well it was the obvious time to to actually roll them out and show them what's coming do a, you know just one more thing so well, page 10 I, in, I your, mean, in the earnings deck has yeah. product section plan for new vehicles including more affordable models remain on track for started production in the first half of 2025. These vehicles will utilize aspects of the next generation platform, as well as aspects of our current platforms, and will be uh, able to be produced on the same manufacturing lines as the current lineup. This approach will allow us achieving less cost reduction than previously expected, but enables us to prudently grow our vehicle volumes in a more CapEx efficient manner during uncertain times this should help us fully utilize our current expected maximum capacity of close to 3 million vehicles, enabling more than 50% growth over 2023 production before, before investing in new manufacturing lines. Yeah. And when I went back to read it, I thought to myself, what happens if they're doing a stripped down Model Y or a stripped down Model 3? You know, we've kind of seen a little bit of that already in China. We, um, Mexico. It, it, yeah, sorry, in Mexico, Mexico. So I don't know. I, I, I will. I, I have a very, I have a very good feeling of what these vehicles are. Hmm. The new, the the twenty twenty five second half compact vehicle has a series of modules that are going to be used for unboxed. The mm. new thousand sub thousand dollar motor, the new battery packs, um, potentially the forty eight volt architecture. There's many many subsystems inside of the vehicle that were being redesigned for the twenty five k cost profile, and all of these things are electrical or electromechanical, right? Which would have had to have preceded the 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 mechanical structure and system level assembly ramp by at least two quarters. So. I believe what Tesla did is they left those modules on track, uh, pedal to the metal. They redesigned the robo taxi and then extending that out to more of the second half. And so what they're doing is they're pulling those modules in and they're either going to do miniaturized versions of maybe the Y or some version that's somewhat like that, that can be built on a serial manufacturing line. And they're going to use those modules, those modules from a cogs perspective, are going to be meaningfully lower than the modules that are currently in the Y. And then when they get those to volume in the first half of the year, by the time they introduce the compact vehicle, those modules are already going to be at their peak in terms of in, you know, cost improvement. And it's going to help that ramp even better. So, I mean, that's what I, when I read the, the press, the download, the presser from, from earnings, that's what, I gather, and that's when I look at the sequence of how they're going to have to ramp the vehicle. I think they're they're pulling those modules forward into these vehicles. That's going to bring the price down. And you're right; they could be stripping other things out um, to bring the price down further. And that's what these new and they could be changing the front fascia and the rear okay. to make the car look more you know meaningfully different and be of tremendous value for consumers because they're going to get these new lower cost modules inside, which aren't going to feel any different to them, but they were radically designed over the last two years to be lower cost. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I just hope you're right. I, you know, I'm kind of trying to understand what would Elon do? And I'm hoping Elon's not going to be too Elon-ish on the subject. So we'll see. 
Yeah, it's an interesting it's an interesting call out for sure. And he seems busy these days, right? Between politics, elections, uh, getting the government efficient, and I don't know what else. Maybe he gives the Tesla a bit of a break. I don't think he gives anybody a break. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, our topic today was Tesla, is it ready for the breakthrough? We've covered that. I'm going to jump past Tesla Analyst for now. Let's go straight to Ford's sacred strategy. And then maybe if we have time, we'll go back to Tesla Analysts are often wrong, especially compared to 2019. So let's go to, um, uh, you want to set this up for the Ford Scott Quirks, Alexander? Sure. <clears throat> sure. So um, we've heard over the last two years, Jim Farley, CEO of, of Ford, speak about Skunk Works, which is the entity they set up in California. And uh, I was, you know, looking at that from time to time. My husband was looking at it a lot. And then came this Monday, a very good article in um, in a paper that's called the information now, it's not a paper anymore it's obviously online um and um i think they're particularly good in the ev sector and in the battery sector they have steve devin who is a, a very high-end journalist in this field and he did a real deep deep dive into that i read that article and i reached out to all of you and said i think i should sum this up because um contrary to where he left it i have a conclusion um to to what he all wrote so i'm going to present that to you and i'm going to give you ahead of time my conclusion mm -hmm. because i want you to follow me through on that my conclusion is that contrary to what herbert always tells us of course <laughs> yeah uh, um, that Ford will not be mm -hmm. for, Ford will not be the first one, the first OEM to license te, um, Tesla's FSD. Now I could be completely wrong, but mm. once we go through this, you will see how big their struggle is, how concentrated they are on building a car. So FSD is very far from anything, and and I just want to make that point from the beginning so that you look at it with the same view. Uh, I look at it. Um, so that was a picture they used in in that article. Uh, I put it on on the bottom. The information, Steve Levin, 16th of September, um, and and he referred to an interview that Jim Farley did with Brian Sozi on the opening bit of Yahoo Finance in June this year, and where he. So this is one of the latest interviews, in depth interviews we have on the subject. There's another one coming up with the CEO, CFO, um, and there he said Skunk Works Engineering is a completely different approach. Well, a different approach to Ford's OEM engineering, a different product at a different cost and a small a much smaller battery and different chemistry now that gives me the feeling they really are going for something low cost right so low cost cost reduction seems to be the main focus on it um and and it has to become profitable so if you want to flip to the next slide please um so why did they call it Skunkworks? Well, Skunkworks was the name of the famed unit of uh, Lockheed Martin when they created the, the st uh, steel fighter jet. They set it up quasi independent from Ford. Uh, Jim Farley always says, I don't even have the badge to go in there by myself in 2022 in California to reinvent Ford's EV effort. They have about now 300 employees. There will be a new facility in, uh, in Long Beach where they're moving to in a couple of weeks the objective is a profitable thirty thousand dollars ev pickup listen to me pickup mm. so robo taxi fsd pickup doesn't go in my line okay but we'll see mm -hmm. and that shall hit the market in 2027 so we're far to go uh, they're working on multiple models but it's all really relatively small powered by LIP, lip batteries prices from the high 20s to the high 40s so we're in a really low segment ford said in a press release in august so that's the latest that the skunk works objective was to fundamentally rethink the full vehicle and Farley said he had marching order to drive a radical change in how we develop an electric vehicle so it's all about the change in manufacturing the change of building a car Keep on going because there are a couple of, of uh, slides coming. Um, then the, the other person I mentioned earlier is the CFO, John Lawler, who was on Bloomberg TV in February this year. And he insisted very heavily on squeezing costs by scrutinizing all the material that go into a vehicle as well as how they reach the U.S., how these materials reach the U.S. And only then will they 
understand how they sell the cars and how they distribute it and sell it. So it may not actually be sold by the four dealerships, right? This may be a completely different way of doing it. So if you think about all that, this is Tesla 2013 and even, right? This is like way back, way back. Keep on going because it's, it's getting really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, oh, this one we already had. I think you have to go in the other way. Okay. Oh, there we go again. Oh, Keep yeah, on going. That. Maybe it's it's twice there. Am I going the wrong way? There. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it, the next one is the one where Jim Farley predicts exactly in 2022 mm -hmm. that by the end of 23 they would be selling 600,000 EVs. Well, they sell, sold 72,000, and by the end of 26 they would be selling two millions. Well, that's a long pipe dream as well because all they have is the Mac E and um, and the um, the truck, and they are losing on average 47,000 dollars per ev and probably this year the ev loss is about 5.5 billion so that 2022 prediction is wrong but he saw it very early if you keep on going because he then realized they have to completely shift so they hired many former employees from tesla apple lucid and rivian so like i said earlier it's 300 employees you find about a hundred and something profiles on linkedin from those hundred and something profiles 39 had worked prior for tesla 24 for mm -hmm. apple 22 for rivian over 75 percent of those veterans are either from tesla apple rivian lucid google microsoft or similar so they they, they are pulling talent from where they can and keep on going i'm getting into the details of this in a second um keep on going her but yeah well this one is you don't see much so this is the, the first list of uh, where the people come from but i actually went into the main profiles i researched them on linkedin and whatever so keep on going so this is what, what's happening now is a little bit more deep than the article initially was you can go on the next step so the first person they hired was doug field that was september 2021 he was the person in charge of the Titan EV project for Apple for the three years prior to moving to, to mm -hmm. Ford. Before that, he was senior VP engineering for Tesla for five years. And before that, he was at Apple again. So it just moved all right. And he started actually his career at Ford. He is from MIT, where he had an MS in mecha mechanical engineering and then an MBA. And his mission, and he's the big boss of what is called the, the EV section now. Um, for skunk works in within ford and then he started recruiting so keep on going there is the next one with alan clark so he is head of project and head of advanced ev development he was the the, the second big recruitment that was in january 2022 he was 12 years with tesla from 2009 to 2022 he was associated to the design uh, engineering for the model s x roadster 3 and y meaning all he worked on the cybertruck prototype in 1819 and he led that battery swap model that they tried between 13 and 15. So he was on all major projects. He was prior to that at Honda, Honda um, Formula One race, uh, uh, racing and Bennett uh, Automotive. So he, this is the car person, but clearly a car design person. Okay. Keep on going. <clears throat> Then they they hired um, Andrew Reimer. He is the principal architect engineer in this. So, so Skunk Works on their on their business cards. Obviously, it's not called Skunk Works. It's called Advanced EV Development Team. That's what they all belong to. So he came from Lyft. So you can say, okay, so maybe he comes from Lyft. So here we are in a robo taxi model. Not at all. For Lyft, he worked. He was the principal engineer for the e bike. And before that, he was at Tesla 2015 to 19, where he was senior mechanical engineer for the chassis dynamics. Before that, Senbus, and he is a uh, BIS, I think he's actually, yeah, British Columbia is, is Canadian. So that was Andrew. And then keep on going. Um, the next one is Cameron Rogers. So he was hired in June. So this is, I, I put them in chronological order. He was 17 years with Apple, had uh, adopted Xbox and PlayStation to the iPhone couple of, of those things. He also worked the last two years on that EV development program, like the person we spoke um, first about, and then uh, Doug Field, and then keep on going there because there's still a couple of, of key people. So this is Salem Mert. He's head of aerodynamics. He's actually from inside Ford. He changed. He was in charge of over the air software updates and now changed of teams and is now head of aerodynamics. So when I hear all that, this is all people building cars. This is not people building cars 
for full self-driving. I'm, I'm sorry to say so. You know, I, I just have the feeling there's um, something. Why, why would you say that? Well, because they're building a car. They're working on cheapest material. They're working on supply chain. They're working. It's they're, they're exactly, coming... it's exactly what they have to do for an FSD car. That's, that's what Tesla is doing right now. Well, well, they're working on a pickup. Would you, if, if you're, if you're bringing to the market 2027 joker product that's going to make you profitable is a low cost pickup. Do you think FSD would be a priority? Would be a fantastic add on, an incredible add on. What, um, what a, what a sales, uh, what a incredible uh, opportunity to add real, you know, margin, fantastic margin. I mean, margin is going to be the struggle here. It, it, it the bottom line is a twenty-five thousand dollar EV. No matter how much engineering they put into it, is not going to yield Ford very much margin. Pickup or no pickup, uh, forty thousand dollars are not going to yield too much margin. They have to be at Tesla scale and Tesla's um, experience to be able to make that margin. Yeah, they're building a car. Yeah, of course they're building a car. But if I were in charge of Ford, I would be looking to add FSD as an option because for every time I sell FSD, I triple my margin on that vehicle. And it doesn't have okay, to be well, a road. Okay, let me continue pack. on. Yeah. Well, let me continue on. And also keep in mind that Elon said he's not looking for an FSD partner that is less than a million cars per year, right? So, and and do we all agree? Because that that's actually a very right. fundamental question. Do we all agree yeah. that Elon will only license FSD to EVs, to full battery EVs? Oh yeah, for for okay. sure. Okay, for sure, no doubt. I, I I think putting FSD in a in an ICE vehicle is going to be very difficult. Very difficult. Yeah. But anyway, already I mean, mechanically, I agree. Okay. So let, let me just continue my, my thought because I'm still convinced of that, but I obviously could be completely wrong. Uh, so then they acquired a company. They acquired um, Automotive Power, which was founded by Anil Payani. I hope I didn't butcher that too much, who worked very closely uh, with Tesla as a supplier when Alan Clark, the number two I mentioned earlier, was at Tesla. So he is now executive director of engineering at Ford. He purchased, uh, they were purchased by Ford in November 23. They were set up in California. The whole 149 people, more or less, were um, absorbed and became Ford employees. And they are in everything that's power management, right? That's what they're, that's what they're, um, uh, specific to is and now belongs to Ford. So they are now part of that team in California. They they currently had a different site, but now all moving together into that Long Beach site. Keep on going, please. Um, so what do we know? So we know it's going to be a smaller pickup or maybe SUV, but they're really talking all the time about pickup with, with an LFP cathode. The, the, the main word for the batteries was cheap. Cheap and a reasonable range may not be an impressive range, but they 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 are trying to be on the lower end. Batteries will come from Ford's new LFP factory in Marshall, Michigan, which is which is using the technology licensed from the China Contemporary um, uh, Amperex Technology Limited company. So that that is that uh, that joint venture that is going to deliver them those those batteries. The cost. After the federal tax credit, that's what they, they stated, will be in that between the high 20s and the high 40s. Must be profitable, otherwise it's not going to go into mass production, but that doesn't mean it will be profitable from day one. Keep on going, please, to the second chart of these of the summary. Um, they So the other thing that is surprising, they want to have an array of models comparable to the BYD model. So they are, they are comparing to themselves to to BYD much more than Tesla. Um, they clearly admit that no single model will have a superstar volume. Additional income will come from software subscriptions. There you have it, Larry. But the ones they are mentioning is over the air updates, entertainment, hands-free, ice-free, autonomous driving on highways, which is what they That's already have. 
That's, yeah, but that's what they have on highways. That's what they pretend to have. But the difference between what they have and FSD would make a huge difference to the bottom line. They're not going to say FSD there. But anyway, look, I mean, I, nothing that I've seen so far militates against them um, Being the licensing one? FSD. And if, and if I were setting strategy for them, I would certainly be looking at FSD as What's... a key component of increasing my margin. Well, then That's let the me give sentence. me Exactly. Yeah. So give me the last sentence. So they will not play in the fully autonomous robot taxi field. Farley said they did not figure out that removing the driver would create even a business. So that's the last sentence I, I, I put in there because that, I mean, Farley can say that and maybe he's playing poker and means something completely else. For me, I it just sounds so completely... They're so early. I mean, what, what I'm showing you is some, some stuff is two years old, some stuff is six months old. We don't know much more, but it just feels as if they are so struck, so hard. It's so hard and the struggle is so real for them to get to a profitable pickup truck that FSD seems like the last of their issues. I think it should yeah. be the first because if I were doing the, what they're doing and I'm looking at making a thousand to four thousand dollars margin on a vehicle. I would want to get that extra five or seven thousand. I wanted to double my margin by licensing FSD. That's such a, it's a no brainer. It's literally a no brainer. It means double the margin for the same vehicle yeah. at almost no cost to them. Almost well, no cost to them. Well, we'll see. So Ford no longer pretends they can beat Tesla and lead in EV. So the, the language has completely changed. Remember last year when Farley went up on stage and uh, take that Tesla and whatever, that, that's all gone. Uh, the communication is on offering consumers the choice of powertrains. So they actually do that now uh, in their ads on, on, on Sunday TV, you know, in the, between the sports stuff, whatever, saying the consumer. Who has the choice between combustion hybrid and EV? So they're really insisting on that. Um, their main competitor, they call themselves their main competitor, is now Chinese EVs entering the US market. Now, you all know my theory. I don't think they'll come that, that soon, but that, that seems to be Farley's uh, clear focus. And then in Aspen this year at the Ideas Festival in June, he said, if we don't make this EV transition, Ford is not going to make it. Well, that was helpful. It was yeah. really good. Yeah, if they don't make that transition, Farley's not going to make it. But that's beside the point. Yeah, I, yeah, I think uh, I, that was good. It was really good. To, one one of the things that's there, I think different things are going to stand out for different people. One is it looks like everybody's coming from three different areas. They're they're coming from Tesla, Rivian, Apple mainly, and maybe there's a fourth. Um, that's hard to do in a small group uh, because they all have different product development styles and and they all have different cross departmental styles so there's going to have to be some sort of clear leadership established maybe that's doug maybe that's alan both tesla x tesla in this situation uh, but that to me is going to be a challenge for them to figure out how to how to do that and then i do think that uh you know if tesla is going for for FSD, for, for companies that have, you know, a concentration in volume on product. Uh, yeah, the, to me, Ford's not going to be there for a long period of time. So I, I, I'm kind of on that, you know, it's going to be maybe a Volkswagen, maybe a Chinese, um, yeah, for, uh, Ford is selling company. about four million. Ford is selling about four million cars per year. BYD is now at 4 million, right? So it's, uh, it, it you know, it, I think the shift is so enormous that I just don't see the OEMs. And and Volkswagen, you know my you know my Führer. I mean, you all know my personal story with Volkswagen. But the fact that they are ready to invest five billion in Rivian software just tells me there's no hope to wait for Volkswagen. And and uh, there that we should not. Volkswagen would be the ideal candidate, and these would still be here. Everybody would say it's Volkswagen that's going to be the first one. But given their stupidity i hope my brother doesn't hear me um it, it, there's just no way that volkswagen is gonna you know take their pride and go and knock on the door of tesla they just won't do it the, the only thing i'd say about that is the software they're buying and they're partnering with rivian on is completely different than the vehicle control software fsd software this is the 
how how does the car operate? Uh, but I but I I I take your point on that. Um, so anyway, it's just be interesting to see like if you just play out the Skunk Works thing. If they launch in twenty twenty seven, you know, it took Tesla two to three years really to get Model Y to volume. Yeah. But it doesn't look like they're launching with a single product, like, you know, 70, 80% of volume, you know, 70% of Tesla volume is, is Model Y. Yeah. And that actually helped Tesla concentrate their COGS reductions and improve their gross Genius. margins. And if they're launching with this strategy, they said of multiple SKUs and you're a startup, that is usually not a good recipe for financial yeah. success. So that would be, some of my feedback to the team, unless they have some sort of major platform strategy where there's very little differentiation in terms of, you know, they have some concentration in bill of material purchase, and then they're just doing fascia changes on these products. But anyway, so it's, it's an interesting thing to, to kind of think through. They're, they're three years away um, yeah. from even launching a product. At least. I think they're closer to five years away uh, yeah. from what I can see. I mean, if you look at Tesla's Model 3, I mean, it took them three and a half years, and that was after they had complete the, after they had done the S, actually almost four years. I just can't see Ford doing this in under five years. But, you know, I mean, these are guesstimates that we as outsiders are making. But um, I, I find the uh, strategy that they've laid out a little hard to – Hard to digest. Okay. I actually don't. So uh, let, let me explain why I think this might make sense. So first of all, the reason why I think that Ford might be one of the first partners with Tesla is because I think they're the only company, really, the only auto company that cares about their brand. Um, Alexander, you had a fantastic analysis, right, where you explained that every single CEO of all these automakers, they're all going to, they're, 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 you know, their tenure is going to end in a couple of years, two or three years from now. And none of them care about the brand. They just care about their salary and their package. Ford is owned by the family. They don't want the company to go down. Now, they created the Skunk Works. And my understanding is that Ford realizes they cannot compete head-to-head -head with anybody. Uh, so they want to find a niche. And their niche is commercial. I thought that they've already been saying much more recently in the last six months that they're now going to focus more on their commercial business. So this being a pickup and multiple pickups heading into the autonomous kind of pickup, the small pickup area, might make sense as being their way to enter in and find a niche, can, can survive as a company, and don't go head-to-head -head with others. Yeah, no, that's, that, not, that's not wrong. Mm -hmm. But I, let me add, Porsche has the same the same structure. Porsche has a CEO in place, but there's the, sorry, Volkswagen, but there's the Porsche family behind it. So you could hope that they as well, you know, they're not interested just by their tenure, but by the long-term outlook and look, that's not true for the Porsche family. Yeah. So uh, it's, uh, it, it, well, I mean, I, I hope the one. Ford family, yeah, I hope you the Ford family. You can the one for the other. I mean, Ford got through the great uh, 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 global financial crisis, you know, without going bankrupt. And they didn't go bankrupt for one really, really good reason. Right. Now, Porsche got the government behind them, their own, you know, some percentage by the state of not this time, yeah. Yeah. So I mean I I am absolutely I think Jeff is right about the strategy. I, I think you've done a fantastic job of breaking it down. I don't see anything in that deck that would militate against them making a deal with um with Tesla. And honestly, I said the same thing in the charging network. I, I didn't see any reason why they wouldn't. It just made no sense at all. And when Mr. Levine came in and said, oh, we've got our own charging network. It's bigger than Tesla's. His uh, CEO put him in, 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 into his place. So I, I, think that the, I think the deck is stacked. I think Ford are going to do a deal. They may not be the first, by the way, but I think they're going to do a deal. But who cares? I mean, they have no volume. They're, that that deck it's nothing i mean they're gonna have any volume like you said for five years probably until they have any meaningful yeah. volume and where's tesla gonna yeah. be so yeah. it, to me tesla's got to figure out trajectory wise who has a, a serious concentrated portfolio in ev i'm not sure 
you know, we have to see what BYD does on the platform side, because I don't know how many vehicles are on the same platform or not. I just know there's about 21 vehicles that are producing the volumes that they have today. So again, if you're Tesla, you want to work, you want to get a partnership going, but you want to work in some sort of concentrated bit of volume. Uh, so your, you know, your efforts are, you know, are put to good use versus somebody that's all over the place and skews. So the key here is when do they get the volume? And what I, what I see here, by the way, why, how is this information getting out from a skunk works project where the CEO <laughs> doesn't have access to the room? How's this even getting out? <laughs> and that's, and that's why I'm paying the 300 bucks per year for information. They do have <laughs> obviously very good informant because this is not the first time I see a really good article from them. I mean, this time, you know, it, it fitted obviously our OEM analysis and how they are all uh, taking like a getting actually more delayed than anything but uh, but the information is because i mean there are probably people leaking to uh, uh laura kolotny or to dana hull or to the wall street journal uh but i have the feeling they have more business insiders and and sometimes you know real good real good information that they're worth their 300 bucks hey jeff how many employees does byd have today seven you thought uh, they they bumped it up i, I uh, yeah, uh, it's. I think it's up to nine hundred thousand actually. Yeah, and it, you know where it's going to? They said one point one million. <laughs> nine hundred thousand yeah. as of September. Nine hundred thousand as of September, and they're hiring like crazy, and they produce you know more cars than Tesla. But I mean, it, it's crazy to me. It's just crazy. They talked about a hundred thousand people in R and D. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, the R and D efficiency metrics are going to be interesting to yeah. to plot out. <laughs> wow, you know what? They're number two. Just so you know, in terms of EV battery, they have a good battery business. They're number Very two good. in yeah. EV battery cells and packs sold. So if they see that scaling up, you know they have a pretty good business there. They have a good components business. They they literally work with the top tier. OEMs, when you think of whatever's on your wrist or whatever tablet you're looking at, it's high probability that they have a, a mechanical component yep. in that. So they have a fairly good, that is driving it, but it'd be interesting if they actually broke it out in terms of automotive components business and battery business. But uh, their, you know, their, 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 their growth in hiring has been uh, roughly equivalent to their growth in the automotive. I don't know how well their component business is growing but the, if if you track their hiring it tracks with the curve of their uh, uh of their motor vehicle business because i've done that tracking so <laughs> it's that looks to me like an awful lot of people i mean i know it's china but that's still an awful lot of people Okay. Yes, well, first of all, thank you so much, Alexandra. That effort and that sure. work yep. was very Great formative. Yeah. Lots yeah. of information I've never seen before. I'm sure the audience has not seen before. Important information yeah. for I've seen. So thank you for putting that together. Um, yeah, I think I'm changing my mind. I agree with you. Some of your points. Uh, Ford needs to have at least a million plus cars. Uh, and they're not going to get there. So they're not likely going to be it. Um, yeah, you made some good points. I appreciate that. Uh, go to the next topic here, which is EV sales. So we've got some actual data points, some graphs here that show you what's happening in uh, EVs across the world, global. And so, Jeff, why don't you explain to us uh, what's going on here? Yeah, and there's just a couple of charts, uh, and they were uh, they were posted earlier today. You can see the the credit at the bottom left of the screen. Uh, I mean, what's happening? There's something happening in the auto industry, right? Right now. We've had this somewhat stagnation, depending on on what region you're in. There's either stagnation or, or slowdown in growth just in total auto, even over the last seven years. You know, six, seven years ago is when the last time that the United States built the most number of vehicles they ever had in a year. Every year since then, total vehicles have come down. So you're talking about a supply chain in the U.S. that was equipped to build 20, 21 million vehicles. That's doing 15 million now. And then now the landscape is changed because about 10% of those are EVs and there's a huge, there's a bigger component of hybrid. So all this chart says is combustion engines are going down as a percent of sales 
uh, and, and they're just going down. It's going to be this, you know, this gradual decline um, that occurs, but you know, it's going down and that CapEx is still there. A lot of those people are still there. So there's this great conversion that has to happen. You go to the next slide. This is U S by well, the way. First of all, yeah, this is just U S which is the slowest. And so if you, the rest of the world is much faster than this. It's going to be meaningfully faster. That's right, Herbert. And this is battery electric in the US. And everybody says, here's the key takeaway from this. We live in a 24 seven news cycle where every three hours, someone's trying to come up <laughs> and spin some sort of metric. By the way, the bulls do it, the bears do it. It's, mm -hmm. you know, this is the world we live in. But when these, when you look at these mega trends like this, you have to look at them over a long time period because there's gonna be puts and takes. But if you look at that yellow line, this number is still going up into the right in terms of sale uh, percent sales of uh, plug-in vehicles. Now there's a, a BEV component, and uh, which is the blue bar, the dark blue bar, then there's plug-in hybrid, and then there's a total percent uh, of them. And in general, it is still going up and to the right. You are gonna get periods of time as we had periods of time in 2022, and we had periods of time in 2021 where there's a slowdown in growth. Look at 2021. If you go to the left of the slide, 3.3, 3.4, 3.4, you're going to have those periods of time, but then it's, you know, as long as you're working on the better solution, uh, that's better for the, the end consumer. And now look what's happened over that three year time frame. Tesla has achieved price, uh, MSRP parity. Tesla has achieved, not everyone. Tesla has achieved MSRP parity with combustion engine vehicles. You actually get in terms of performance perspective, actually a much better product for the same uh, amount of price out the door. That's what's happened over that three year time period. So you're, there's really no, there's, you, there's no step down getting into an EV anymore. So up and to the right, continuing with, with EVs. And, um, and this is just, this was a, this is a monthly view um, that kind of shows some of that, that variation, but it, in, in general, it is, you know, up and, and to the right in terms of EV sales. So key takeaway is, we're in a 24 seven news cycle. You're going to hear that no one wants, you've been hearing no one wants EVs this, this whole year, but the trend is still going up and to the right. Let this last month was, I think the, the largest month in terms of EV sales. And, and I, I believe a lot of this is based on activation data as well. That's important to know. It's not just product going into inventory. So, um, so we'll see the, the car industry has, it has some mixed, metrics this is this is again the us in europe you know you've seen you know a relative you've seen a slowdown year on year in terms of total vehicle sales so europe is a special uh, case though yeah europe is a special case that has to do with um you know government support ending at the end of december last year and not resuming until probably the beginning of next year so you really have had a special case um I would also say that there's an irony in the numbers in the U.S., and that is the day the IRA hit, EV sales dropped. Yeah. And they're only beginning to recover their old growth the rate now. And that's, you know, it's very interesting to me. I, I think that it's, yeah, it's very interesting. In, in China, though, hybrids are right now, burning it up and evs are growing but nothing like the hybrid not the rate of hybrids yeah in the in the us there is this great build out there's sales into wholesale which is yeah. car factories building product and shipping them to dealerships and then there's activation trends and what the the non tesla oem folks realize is that they can't build these things at a profit and they're not selling and their dealer network doesn't want to sell them because right. it's not attached with a great service plan and all the other things that they make margin off of. And when all that realization took place, they, they grew, they grew their inventory to 150 to 200 days. And then since then they've been burning it off by the way, to some, you know, despair of Tesla because they've been taking huge discounts on these vehicles to burn off that inventory. And Tesla has been going head to head with that over the last several quarters. Right. So yeah, it's, it's been, a, it's been ironic. Tesla has, 
has honestly enjoyed most of the IRA benefit, ironically, right. enjoyed most of the IRA benefit in the United States. And to add irony to irony, uh, they're going to get, you know, all these ZIV credits on top of that. So it it it's a sad story, but, uh, you know, the story continues. <laughs> Tesla just keeps going, just keeps going, just keeps going. Oh, and no. did, yeah, you, and was... did you actually, just to get back to Ford, did you hear that, Larry? I think we said it two or three shows ago, that Ford already budgeted close to $4 billion for the coming years in ZEF credits they have to pay. <laughs> $2 billion of that is going to go to this Tesla, is... according to Morgan Stanley. I... <laughs> This is crazy. This is absolutely yeah. crazy. Yeah. And I was going to ask, that was the exact I, point I was going to make, Alexandra. Is that even, did they even attribute that to the EV business or did they just take that at the top line of Ford Inc.? Because if you saddle their EV, their EV EBIT margins with that $4 billion in ZEV credits. Exactly. And this year, this year they're, they're making $5.5 billion loss already. It's the other way around. They should settle their ice business with ZEV credits because that's what that's I'm exactly saying. It. EV business yeah. really, it really adds up. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, okay. I mean, Larry, the other, the other, the, the, I would say the, I would say the inverse to that is if their EV business was, was vibrant and pushing yeah. out a lot of product, they would not have had to buy all right. those credits. Right, right. But the, but the ZEV credits arise because they do not have that business running yet. And so, Correct. Yeah. Since they uh, lose money on it, why let it run? That is just it. They're running like cats trying to catch their Okay, I, yeah. I do want to thank uh, Jesse, this guy, Jesse Jenkins. Follow him on X. This is who where we got these graphs from. Appreciate Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And um, this one is, uh, yeah, this is what's happening. So Europe, it's, all these automakers have been begging the governments. You know, Italy did it. Volkswagen just did it to European Union saying, please delay these targets for ICE vehicle, uh, carbon monoxide targets. EU came back and said, nope, we're not going to do that. We're yeah. sorry. We've been telling you a long time. And it looks like that uh, there's going to be a fine in 2025 if they I don't think do they, this. I think they'll blink. Billion. Hmm? I don't think they will. Be, I think they'll blink. Larry, they did not in 2020. And they're pulling that card all the time, but... saying that, you know, we didn't. And then in 2021, suddenly you were able to adjust. We want you to get to 22% of sales being when... EVs. We told you five years ago, this is coming. When we see 300,000 people being put on, being laid off or put on part-time, I think they'll blink. I don't think they'll blink to eliminate it, but I think they will put Delayed. stay it all. Yeah, because the mm. politics of it is very, very tough. Very tough. Oh, yeah. And I mean, so many elections as well in Europe. So many elections in like the next uh, 12 to 24 months. This is crazy. And the elections are not going well. Oh, so no. They can't afford people to be put out of work. Mm. Yep. But it, it's tough to be an OEM. It really is. And and the one we're not talking about, and I'm, uh, I put on my calendar to, to do a deep dive on, is Toyota. Because we always, you know, everybody tells us, oh, but there is the king of efficiency. There's Toyota. They will come. While hybrid sell, yes. But wait until the first generation of hybrid owners has had it with hybrids, understands the high cost of it, understands all the maintenance that comes with it. And then doesn't want a hybrid anymore. Then watch Toyota. Yeah, I'm I'm probably again more pessimistic than the three of you because I think all I've heard each of you say that you think that hybrid is a sugar high. It's a one time thing. People, consumers, I don't think so. I think that consumers don't know any better. <laughs> Sorry, I'm go I'm gonna get hit for that. The OEMs are going to just fool the consumers. They're calling it electric. It qualifies for the IRAs. They put a little tiny battery Very and, few of they, them do. They, and they they make it as if that they are uh, you know electric and then um you know best of both worlds so you saw the rise in uh hybrid sales in china what makes you think that this isn't longer term why alexander is, it just is right alexander is right the hard life the tough the tough world for the hybrid owner comes in the fourth and the fifth year and these cars are going to yeah. drop in value so dramatically, like a stone. I think at that point, people will begin to realize what's going on. Look. All right, four and five years from now. So that's <laughs> in, in China, Tesla's business is growing like Billio. They're doing great. The, you know, they're still the top selling EV 
in the country. People are building these, this different range of hybrids. At a point in time, they will either be legislated away or people will realize the problem. So I think it is a sugar high, and I think it may it may last for another half a decade or decade. Yeah, that's what I'm but saying. But it's going yeah. away. That's one hell of a high. Well, five, and EV yeah. and oh, EVs yeah. will become cheaper, and we'll have more and more features that hybrids won't have, including obviously full self drive. That'll yeah. be it. Five That's years, true, but five years five is what years I was saying. Nothing. I wasn't thinking that it was just a blip for yeah. one or two years. I think it's. But we can have that years. discussion that I had with Gary the other day, where I told him that I don't care about anything short term. All I want, and he said that says it all, meaning mm -hmm. obviously that you know how how unreasonable I can only be. But that's just because there are different horizons, right? And maybe yeah. hybrids' yeah. Uh, lifespan is another five years and then, or sugar high is another five years and then it will dampen out. I mean, those costs won't disappear from one day to the other, but uh, but uh, their their significance will go down. It, it, there's no doubt about it. I mean, nothing yeah. speaks for hybrids other than mm -hmm. currently they're pushed Agreed. by their producers. If battery prices continue plummeting the way they have. Yeah. Hybrids got to go out of business. Mm -hmm. yeah. anyway. All right. Well, we covered a lot of topics and I appreciate the panel members today. Hopefully you guys will follow. This is Cyber, uh, Cyber Bulls. Uh, only the best. Look at this. Alexandra, Jeff, and uh, Larry Goldberg. Uh, brilliant analysis. New information you haven't seen before. And uh, the commentary is just top notch. Appreciate all of you guys. This is great. Um, thank, thank you, you, Herbert. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thank you, wow. Herbert. Thank you all. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.